though. So I appreciate all the all the comments and feedback and all the new subs and all that. That's pretty cool. Um, so I figured this next little untold uh, it's gonna be more like a it's not really an encounter it's just gonna be untold you know it's more of a memory um, it won't be so as intense it's just gonna be a good memory uh, and as a kid growing up some of them some of them best memories are made during the summertime um, and I'm gonna go into detail about like a, a couple couple good memories of logging back when my dad was a logger uh, now where he logged it was a uh, if I'm not mistaken it was right at the edge of a different county uh, it it was more sparsely populated than the county we lived in um, which was kind of hard to believe but going out there man it was like you were going out there man um, everything just got thicker, taller, deeper, you know, and so one of the details I think I need to explain is, um, out there, them gas stations, uh, you know, it ain't like a, one of these gas stations you'd find, find in a big town or even a small town. Um, these gas stations were built who knows when, you know, and they had pumps. Sometimes you had to hand crank the pump. Um, but the gas would sit in there and, you know, they, they'd pay for this gas to be delivered and then they wouldn't even sell it and then it became useless. So what you had is you'd have, uh, they'd sell it to like farmers or whatever, because them farmers knew, uh, the gas that just sat there, you know, what, what goes on is the, the octane that carries that, that fuel to the combustion chamber it evapor evaporated so what they would do is they would add uh, the right amount of moonshine and just mix it in there and that uh that uh i guess ethanol or whatever from the moonshine uh you know that whatever burns your nose when you go to sniff moonshine that same burn was basically an octane to carry the fuel so them farmers knew they could buy this old fuel from these old gas stations, you know, and it was helping out the gas station because they, they were kind of cutting their losses, you know, and uh, they could pay to get new fuel. And so I'm saying all this because, man, <clears throat> so we're going out into the, the boonies of the boonies uh, to go logging. And uh, out there, they didn't even have any any of those type gas stations that had been around for however long. They had... What I remember going to was like this little old lady's house, and uh, it wasn't a house, her store. What I remember going to as her store, it wasn't any bigger than if you took uh, like two outhouses and put them back to back, and that's more or less what it looked like too. Uh, the, the outside of it was all rickety and the roof was all rickety, but she knew she lived out towards them, uh, them loggers, so she had... Uh, you know 55 gallon drums of this uh, old fuel but she still was able to sell it to the loggers and they'd pay her for it uh, you know because they they just have to add some moonshine which they had plenty of that they they'd make that and uh, depending on what you were running uh, you know you'd add the right amount you know and um, so she had you know she had them barrels there and that was helping out the whole kind of ecosystem because she would sell that and then she'd go buy more from somebody else you know but I mean inside them them two little outhouse back to back that that little shack she had uh, she had everything you'd find basically in a uh, a general store out in them out in them woods man uh, you know even down to like nutty buddies and stuff like that uh, but we went there this old lady uh, her glasses uh, she was so old I bet her glasses could have been made by Benjamin Franklin I mean they were so thick you couldn't really even see her eyes it was just like her her uh, the black part just moving around through this hazy uh, 
crystal fog, you know, but she was so nice to us, man. Dad would stop there and, I mean, we were poor, but she would sell these, uh, she had a pig farm, too. And, um, she would sell these ham sandwiches, man, and they ain't nothing like you ever had before, um, Bucky's or it, it, there was nothing like this in the existence of, of anywhere. This old lady's ham sandwiches is what she was known for, you know, I think that's what bought everything else in that store, <clears throat> but, um, it, it wasn't so much a ham sandwich as much as it was like, uh, uh, basically a quarter of a pig sliced up between two slices of bread. I mean, that ham sandwich was so thick, it'd feed Dad and, and us boys all day long, you know. And he'd go in there, and, and what you'd tell her is, you'd tell her, you know, make it bleed. And, and what that was is she would add all this hot sauce. So these ham sandwiches was coated in this old lady's uh, original recipe hot sauce. And there wasn't nothing like it, I tell you. Uh, you'd go all day off this ham sandwich. And, uh... They, they weren't much either. They were like 70 cents for like a pound and a half of ham. Um, she took care of us though, man. She was maybe, you know, four and a half feet tall tops. Uh, but she was a really nice old lady. So, you know, that <clears throat> that's just one stop on the way too. Because we would stop there to get, you know, that, that bloody ham sandwich to feed all of us through the day. And, uh, so, and that'd be right around sunrise we would get to her. It was always, like, a really cool moment. We'd go in there and we'd get our sweet teas and, you know, we'd get that sandwich and we'd head out. And, uh, so, where he went logging, it, it wasn't nothing like you'd see nowadays, man. Uh, them, them old fellas, they ran mules, um and they used these these winches and stuff when the log truck showed up and they'd they'd hang these logs up in the air and like the log truck would have to sit in this one specific spot and these these old timers would now i say old timers <clears throat> these here loggers uh it, it was a it was a they were some tough old folk man now you look at them you'd think they were about to die i mean the way their skin was just stretched over their bones, like if you had, uh, if you found, if you ever come across like a, a frog that had been sitting out on a rock in the sun for like a day or two, you know, and it died, uh, the way that, that skin just stretches over, uh, that's what these here fellas looked like, you know, and it was, it was a different assortment of, of various sizes, but <clears throat> it would, these here was what you'd call stretch skin people, man. Uh, and they were tough and hardy as nails. Uh, you wouldn't think it by looking at them. But this is just a... It was like a different generation of men. You know? And uh, so they were hardy. And they worked a hard life. And uh, they were just hard people. But they were nice. Uh, one of them, like the lead guy... Uh, they called him the bull. Uh, I think that, you know, back then it was a uh, bull of the woods or something. But he was called Big Bull, and uh, his main his main crew was called uh, he called them his home guards, and uh, they were basically that that skin folk type, uh, the the frog skin type people. That 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 was the bull and his home guard, and uh, they called my dad a bucker. And we were the little bucks, you know. But he was a bucker because he, he was the one cutting wood, you know. And they had all these different size chainsaws. And I mean, my dad had his own chainsaws. But these trees and these woods, they were, this, these fellas, they, uh, they were cutting into the edge of um, an old growth forest. So, he, he, um, stuff you'd find at Home Depot and stuff like that. It just didn't matter in these woods. Uh, those trees would laugh at you if you come out from any kind of do-it-yourself location. These were like, these were special saws, man, you know. And uh, in his home guard, man, uh, one of them, 
he was kind of the heavier set of them. He still had that stretched skin. Uh, he was an old Vietnam vet. But, uh, <clears throat> he was called Cherokee. Uh, uh, and he called me a skookum, you know. He said I was brave as hell going out in the woods. Because I like to go out in the woods, you know, saying hunting when, when we went uh, with Dad. You know, I, I was kind of like a scout, but he called me a skookum. And uh, another reason was he said uh, I had to have Indian blood uh, the way I never got lost. Uh, you know, I'd always come back. No matter how deep I went, I'd always come back, you know. And uh, them Indians, uh, you don't have to have direct Indian blood, you know. You can just be the descendant of an Indian but something about Indian blood animals animals know the difference uh, between Indian blood and non Indian blood uh, they react differently um, just everything about them so uh, that was another reason he he called me a skookum uh, whatever that meant it meant something to him so you know it was just uh, it was a nickname he alone had for me you know but uh so we go logging and um you know sometimes we we get like a it wasn't a, a gym pole it was something else with a it had a spike and a hook on it and, and you'd roll the logs and so i guess i need to describe this area more uh, so these these old timers and, and my dad and stuff they were cutting into these woods and You'd cut in and you, you'd go for a nice thick patch of trees, man. Um, they they had a nickname for that, like a gold mine or something, you know. And if you found like a gold mine, you'd you'd tend to stay in that that little particular valley or ridge or uh, hill line uh, until you ran out of those nice size trees. And generally, up on top one of them there um, uh, gold mines, you'd is where you tend to find the kings and the queens of the forest and uh but <clears throat> so you'd, you'd run you'd run that gold mine until you ran out of gold you know but dragging them big logs with them mules it would leave it would leave uh running trenches um and that's something else right there uh after so many times of dragging logs through an area you'd get this trench and uh it could be dangerous and you could, uh, there was a fella that they, he'd ride that log and he'd whip them mules, you know, uh, or he'd hop back and forth and sometimes he'd ride it, other times he's just hopping back and forth, you know, and it was a fun thing to do. And I can't remember that guy's name, but he, he looked like he was a hundred years old and he moved around like he was a teenager and, uh, he showed me how to, what to look for and when to hop and, uh, you know, there was a there was another position you'd run behind them logs with a rope because once them uh once them ruts were dug out so deep you were hitting other other uh, uh tree roots and stuff and if you hit the right one they'd kick that back of that log up and you'd have to run behind it with a string and you'd hold tension uh you know you'd get used to where those kick spots were but you'd hold tension to save the the the, the guy running the mules from getting like hit by this log you know and uh that was like honestly that would have been like your adhd riddlin uh medicine back then because uh you running that tail boy you better pay attention because you ain't paying attention you gonna run straight into that log and you're gonna learn real quick to pay attention there ain't no doubt you, you paid attention you know to the finest detail just something you do a job like that you better pay attention and uh so i mean it, it was just all these little things uh that, that went along with something that other people be like there ain't no skill involved with, with cutting trees and it, it's just yeah there was uh you just couldn't put it on paper that's the problem um so you had all these neat little things you'd do, man, and uh, those ruts were awesome. And and so you pulling out some trees from the other side, 
there there was a lot of uh, old bull when he'd run I'm gonna call him bull I'd really love to use his name because he he saved my dad's life and that's where I'll wind up going with his story but I'm gonna call him bull um, because he was bull but he'd he'd go up in there you know he'd the re okay so we would find trees and we'd determine if they were worth it by you know how many of us stretched around it and an old bull he'd walk them woods figuring out you know this tree and that tree and his, his knowledge and knowing if you pull these logs it's gonna dig this deep and it, it'll be hitting these roots and he could just look at them woods and see their roots digging down deep in them in that dirt you know he he'd look at it and he'd stare for a while and you know he'd go mm-hmm and he'd take a couple paces and walk off another way and get another looking at it, you know. And he'd look at the treetop and look down. And he was figuring where it's going to fall and where he wanted it to fall, more or less. So he could, you know, he could plan out this route. Because once you start pulling them big logs like that, um, they, they're going to leave. They're going to dig, you know. And <clears throat> so you're cutting normal trees. You'd have one or two mules and some of these big trees you'd have to pull in extra equipment um, they weren't the same and uh, these Kentucky mules I don't know if they bred them with dinosaurs or, or what but they were some big mules it's like when you stood next to them their gravity pulled you to them uh, and them was some hard working animals um, if you can imagine and them was some Kentucky mules uh, so they were strong they were stout uh, Kentucky bluegrass there's a little side story man so Kentucky bluegrass uh, people pay top dollar for them them Kentucky horses Kentucky thoroughbred and the reason that is, is Kentucky bluegrass that's why it's called the bluegrass state is uh, where Kentucky lies is on this uh, limestone rich bedrock that sticks out off that west side of uh, man, Appalachians, you know, and that 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 lime, the limestone, which is why there's so many caves through them regions, but because the limestone it eats away real quick, you know, but it also <clears throat> it turns that grass this this blue looking color. It's not like blue like you'd think blue is. It's it's this hue. You'd have to see it to understand it, but you can see it. It's a blue grass. And so these horses, they eat that blue grass and they absorbed they they absorb in their bones that extra lime. And that lime makes them bones really, really tough. Uh, which is why a thoroughbred Kentucky horse is it holds its value because the one thing you don't want when you're buying a racing horse, uh, you don't want it to have brittle bones because you're you're investing a lot of money and time into getting that thing going fast and uh you get it going fast and it breaks its ankle well there goes your money you know so kentucky thoroughbred horses raised on that kentucky bluegrass them kentucky horses are worth their weight in gold you know and um well same with them kentucky mules them kentucky mules are tough as nails same with us Kentucky folk because we we ate <clears throat> mom made sure uh, one thing we had was a, a garden we were too poor to just live off other people's food that they they had access of and put in a bottle and sold at a store we had to make our own food so uh, our food was grown in that same Kentucky soil with that same uh, Kentucky lime magic and our bones absorbed that same Kentucky steel um, so we were you know that's what made them old timers so strong too is they they couldn't afford to pay for somebody else's excesses they had to make their own and when you have to make your own you're just you're built different than somebody who's had everything uh, so uh, I digress let me go back uh, so they had these big mules and um when you had to bring in extra packs and you had to think out this route it, it was quite a process some people wouldn't think of it it would be but to the bull that was a uh, that was some major mathematics he he was working out that uh it ain't in no no math book it's just something you had to know and, and it went through his head by looking and 
he just knew, you know. So he, he planned out the route, and there was also another process uh, where that tree top fell was important because you wanted to start running. You didn't want to start with the biggest tree, you know what I mean? You you wanted to kind of make a rut, uh, so you know if you you chose right or wrong from the get go before you tried to hook up one of them big bottoms. Um, they called them veneers. You know, you had your cheat stick, you'd run out there, it, it was like marked halfway up. Um, you'd go out there and you'd do basic math and you'd cut like 12 foot pieces and 8 foot pieces and, or, or 10 foot pieces, whatever it may be, you know, um, 16 foot pieces. Uh, even, I think they cut, you know, bigger, but that that's beside the point. Point is, is you, you know, there was a process to it. It wasn't just cut the tree, get it out of here. Not when you're dealing with with a uh, an organism that big. Uh, you had to know something, or or you just looked a fool. <clears throat> so you'd start by you'd hit that top. You'd want it to hit within a certain radius of this this planned out route, and you'd start pulling off you know the top pieces, and you'd dig that rut. And you get the bigger pieces and you dig that rut. And if that rut was turning out right and, you know, you were avoiding a certain, like, bedrock or whatever he was looking for, uh, you'd start to bring, you'd, there'd come that day where uh, you'd set up to, to haul out them big bottoms. And uh, some of them big bottoms, like I said, man, 24 plus feet in diameter. And that was quite a, a task a task it required extra stuff on on every level to get them logs out and uh <clears throat> when you pulled out one of them big old king bottoms like that it it left a scar through that wood through the woods it 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 left a ravine that you know water from that point on is always going to gather in and erode and like it, it permanently will forever have changed the everything to that forest uh, from that point on. And, and them old timers, man, they had they had mythos associated with cutting down certain kings. You can cut down a king, but you there was like if you cut down certain kings, they just didn't cut them. You'd find them, they didn't cut them. You know, but. Uh, so I'd go, I'd go saying hunting, right? And uh, I found this one king, and it really wasn't that far from where they had fell, you know, some of these queens, you know. And uh, th this king, it was humongous. It, it took, it took several. It was extra people. Uh, th this tree was. It was the tree. It had probably been there. I don't know. I ain't even going into it. They gave up counting when when it was felled. They gave up counting them them growth rings uh, at about a thousand. And I don't care what any books say. I just know that uh, yeah, it was a thousand plus. And uh, so this the other thing. Well, I don't know how to disperse the details of this. So. I'm going to start with when I found it. You know, I'm out there saying hunting, and you just, it, it was in the, it, it was right on top, the ridge, past the ridge they were on, and, you know, the woods were all nice and dark. I, that's what kind of attracted me, because um, I knew if them woods were dark, and if it was on the north slope, uh, you're going to be finding some saying. And, uh, so I'd go for the dark, because even, even if the woods weren't, dark from age they were dark from the north because the north got the, the least amount of light you know so it was just something you uh, instinctively would look for when you're out uh, you didn't need to look up at the sun or anything it's just you knew that was north um, so you'd run for it well you'd go for it you know and this thing was up on top of a north facing slope and um, what made it feasible was if you went down that slope it went into that that valley between the two ridges and that valley ran just down the road from 
where the main uh, rigging and everything was set up to haul and uh, put them put the logs up on the trucks so they only had to cut a road maybe another you know not even an eighth of a mile it really wasn't even that far at all it was just around the other side of that ridge <clears throat> so that's what uh that's what kind of authorized the cutting is if it was cut right it'd roll down that hill and save a whole bunch of hauling and then you just run that valley and so um and uh everybody you know dad had committed because when we went out there and we stretched around that tree and it took more than us boys to reach around that tree it was just it was unbelievable and man uh dad was pretty committed to wanting to cut it I think what fed it was uh, everybody else didn't want to cut it uh, even the big bull he was he was kind of you know this is where that mythos comes in he was like man you just there's certain trees you don't cut um, and if you do uh, that that's usually it and um, dad didn't believe in that you know Dad wanted to, you know, say he did it, and especially since none of them, them there fellas even had the, the balls to do it. That's just, so Dad was going to do it, and he committed, you know, so they, the day came, and we stopped for our, our bloody hand, we went out there, and, you know, extra people done showed up, it was a big event, um, as many people showed up, um, it might as well have been a county fair. Uh, they they cleared a good path to it you know and he's up in there and it, it took quite a while to cut that tree it took quite a while to cut that tree he had to make these certain cuts because uh, the way the, the the earth fell off the back side of that tree and you couldn't you couldn't cut it low you had to make these cuts and, and shove these these paddles of wood in and walk around to one side because you wanted to cut it above where the the roots um, kind of broke off from the circle and started making where the wood would finger out from from being able to count the rings to a distortion level you wanted to cut up above that where it was nice and round and on the one side that was about you know maybe eight feet up so he had to have the one side was no problem he can cut but that ain't the way it had to fall, he had to make these these paddle steps that ran up this tree by cutting in with the chainsaw and hammering in this wedge and then stepping on it and cutting in with the chainsaw and hammering this wedge. And he had to do that around the backside to uh, to make the the wedge cut because it had to fall down this down the hill, you know, not not on the hill. It had to fall down the hill. So he's out there and he's he's doing his wedge cut and I mean it was a big saw. Uh, it, I bet it had a four foot five foot blade on it. Uh, Dad's up there on these wedges. Um, you know I was 13 maybe, maybe 14. I think it was 13. You know we were string bean kids. Uh, we had hit our growth spurt. You know so we were. We were still like six foot, five eleven, six foot. There was a lot of big, big kids where we grew up. It wasn't uncommon. There was kids that made us small. Uh, there was kids that were, they had whatever you want to call like a, a, a tumor growth spurt thing. Uh, we went to school with like seven foot two and seven foot four kids. So I mean, it's not like we were big for the area, you know. But we were big, even at that age. But we're standing down there, and I remember looking up because uh, we weren't up on the ridge. We were, we we're back behind it on the side of the ridge because everybody wanted to watch it fall, you know. And you couldn't really see that if you were up on the ridge. And plus, where you were, you could see him cutting, you know, up on them on, on them wedges. He had that five foot plus saw, and it's just throwing sawdust out. Uh, you know, and it, it was it was quite the spectacle, and that went on for you know quite a while and then he got done with that wedge cut and they multiple people went up there to help him hammer that out and that wedge alone was bigger than uh, like a car hood or a 
truck hood. That, that wedge was phenomenally huge. And he knocked that wedge out. <clears throat> and then he moved back to the back side and he, he's digging that saw through that, that tree that's been there since before probably you know who knows right after the last ice age you know who knows and he, he's digging through that 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 material that uh you know time water and light made and it and on, on them limestone backbones you know and he, he's shaving the guts out of it and tearing it up and it's flying everywhere and they got to this point where you heard it and you didn't hear it you felt it it was this tremendous snap dude just you know i mean if if there was geologists set up this is what they would have probably thought was the beginning of an earthquake when he hit that core and the tree had had enough and he cut enough of that 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 bone that held it standing uh the the, the heart of it had, had enough it was like that that moment he he killed it you know what i mean it that that snap uh you cut trees you know what i'm talking about and so it struck and it was like you felt it through the earth and we weren't even close uh we were at a good 50 yards back 100 yards back you know and we felt it and at that moment there was a hush uh through everything it was like the birds even stopped chirping um it, it was it was you knew something just happened in them woods that ain't happened in in eons and uh so you know it, it it took a hush over the crowd and it took a hush over everything except dad with that chainsaw and that's all you heard from that moment and he kept going uh, now you know that strike when it hit he took a back he took a step back you know and he wiped his brow and he had he had that sawdust all over him all over him uh, that sawdust gave him like a plus 500 year age appearance uh, but he went back and he grabbed that chainsaw like nothing he kept cutting and he cut until that chainsaw came out that other side and uh, it was about that time uh, you heard the, that was like the convicting uh, blow. It had that crack again and again and again. And it, the, <clears throat> that tree top was so big. When you're looking up, it was like the sky started moving. It, it disoriented you. Uh, it, it kind of moved, moved the world around you by, by watching it. If you were just looking at it, you got dizzy when it started moving. And it wasn't like it just, you know, this thing, when you heard those final pop, 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 after you came out that side, it's, first off, it sounded like there was a war going on, you know, but that tree started shifting, and, and the whole sky started moving, and it was like, everybody kind of, you know, grabbed, reached for the air to hold themselves steady, and that tree, it slowly just fell, and it, it was breaking this and breaking that and breaking this and breaking that and nothing was going to stop that tree from hitting that ground and this is the point like i was saying if a geologist had his seismo seismograph set up he'd have been wondering what the hell because when that tree hit um there was almost like this ripple effect uh that went through the the, the dead leaves on top and the sticks and everything it, it rolled that earth out uh, and uh, it, there was a wind that accompanied the, accompanied it like when it hit you know and everybody's watching this tree fall down this hill and I mean it it slid off the top and it rolled a little bit which it lost a little bit of where where the bull wanted it to slide and fall you know it rolled a little bit but it, it like once it it fell off that top where he had to wedge out to it kind of springboarded out a little bit so it was airborne for a split second you know but in it, it you know slow mode as a memory it was brilliant and uh it hit that ground and it threw out that wave and the, the sound the impact 
probably showed up on the Richter scale and it, you know we were just country folk we wouldn't have known if somebody came on the TV and said there was an unexpected earthquake of 3.1 we wouldn't have known that but it, it probably actually did do that that day that tree fell um, and so the wind blew out everywhere and it, it took him you know a couple hours to cut this tree and uh, so it was still relatively morning time um, you know so the sun was maybe about you know 45 degrees up and uh, where he just cut this this hole in the canopy uh, the light was coming down through and uh, <clears throat> it was shining with all the dust it almost filled up you know and everybody smoking too it was like everybody smoked uh, tobacco in them in parts of the woods so you had already it was already smoky and it's dusty and, and everything's flying around after this 3.1 earthquake struck by this huge tree falling and I remember I looked up at my dad and he's just standing there with that five foot chainsaw thrown over his shoulder looking down at that tree uh, you know up on its uh, where he cut it and it, that was his moment, you know. Everybody started clapping. <sighs> Damn it. Everybody started clapping. Hooting, hollering. It was like fireworks just went off, dude. It was unbelievable. It was a it was a hell of a moment. And so we all ran up there and like we're all shaking him and he's smiling and hooting and hollering and like Bull didn't. Bull he gave him, you know, a nod and a mm hmm and he walked straight down to that wood, you know. That's what he was after. That's what he paid people for. He paid people for wood and he turned that wood into money, you know. So that's what he went to do. But I mean everybody else Everybody else, Dad was a hero at that moment. Um, it was a dad a boy, you know. And uh, so, when Dad's cutting this tree, you know, we're all standing back down on the hill and all that stuff, and he got his wedges. Um, he come back on the backside. And he starts cutting and cutting. You know, and uh, the backside, you want to dig into the, the heart. And um, the first time he was digging into the heart, uh, he hit something. And uh, they call they call something in a tree. They call it they call it hardware. You know. And the mythos associated with hardware is it's it's got a magnetic draw that uh, all lumberjacks associate to it because no matter what you try and do you're still going to hit that thing uh, no matter what and when you hit a piece of hardware you go from being able to you know uh, make that sawdust fly like like a snow blower down to like you're you're having to force that blade and you don't want to force the blade you want it to cut so you got to back out you got to sharpen that thing and uh, when you're talking about sharpening the blades on a, a a five foot chainsaw um, that, that's a task uh, it wouldn't just be him it'd be several fellas lay, uh, sitting there with them blades and they'd all be almost synced up doing the same sink 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 pulls with them uh, files on them teeth making them sharp and they'd rotate and each one of them knew you could tell uh, they'd done it so many times when you, you got to a part where the other person done did you know, if, if the other guys weren't done yet, you'd have a breather time, uh, enough time to light a cigarette or whatever, and when everybody synced up done, you'd, you'd rotate that blade down, and everybody get another section. And you had to stop several times. If, if you had a, if you had hardware in a tree, especially one that big, you, it prolonged the process. So that's that's one of the reasons it, it took so long to cut that tree, you know. So afterwards you know bull he he going down by the 
by the by the wood and everybody's celebrating and stuff and uh you know dad had uh in the middle of the hardware after it had fallen um what it was was you know that was a king tree so were those were those uh those trees all merged together and spun around you could really tell right down there at the bottom uh, if you cut up high enough you wouldn't even notice but down there you could still tell and, and that hardware was in this pocket that uh somebody had found you know a thousand or two thousand what however old this tree was they had found it when it was coming together um, and they uh, whoever it was had put this black uh, flint blade in it and when that tree fell half of it was in the bottom and half of it half of it was in the in the top and, um, and so dad had, he'd went up there and he'd knelt down and he'd he'd picked up uh, the part it, it was in a pocket like the, the the wood around it was rotted you know it it never grew grew permanently into the tree it was there but it had a pocket enough to where he could pull it out and uh <clears throat> so he and he pulled out his and it was about the size of a like a tv remote you know and it was the black it was like it was a black shiny flint well the bull would walk down in that pocket um it wasn't in that pocket it had fallen out somewhere between during that whole fall but it, it held it held strong long enough to snap it you know so uh, dad found that the bottom half and it was big and everybody could tell is it, it was broken it was a fresh break so um, you know it was like an Easter egg hunt uh, and you had a lot of people looking around in them leaves and stuff to find that other piece and, and they found it and you put those two pieces together and it was a it was a good it was a good black uh, ceremonial flint blade 18 inches 16 inches it was a good sized blade and it was in the heart of what was seemingly a several thousand year old tree and that's why that's what led to us trying to figure out how old it was and it was just it was too hard to discern um, how old it was because the way it formed and how them trees grew together and you know who knows how long the process of uh, that them growing together took let alone you know those the trees themselves you know they had their own uh, you know a thousand year growth uh, rings down there uh, so you had a thousand years per tree and then it took another 500 to a thousand years to grow that big one and who knows how long that grew before it was cut so you know it was a couple thousand years old and here's this huge um, ceremonial blade that just broke as a treasure in the middle um, and uh, like uh, old Cherokee man he he did not like that at all and that that's where the like the eerie mythos associated with that that felon of that tree started <clears throat> and uh you know who got that other half was a big rather argument but ultimately dad only got one half of that blade you know and uh but let's get back to the tree right so the tree's fallen and the next process is you know you gotta you gotta figure out your route you gotta figure this out cut these off do this measure it out and uh, the veneer cuts um, was incredible on that tree uh, uh, normally you'd get one or two veneer cuts if you if it was a good tree you know you get maybe three veneer cuts um, that were really that's top dollar wood um, and they got a lot of veneer cuts off this tree and you would sort of have to sometimes sacrifice your length for a veneer cut because um, I think it has something to do with the branches and where they are and uh, th this uh, this trees veneer strip went way up man and they didn't have to sacrifice so it it was a it was a big payday for uh, for the bull and um, 
I remember that was part of it, you know. And um, the other part was the the amount of mules it took to move these these logs. Uh, the valley worked out good. The tops cleared up. They got them out of the way. Um, they brought in a couple, two, four mules for for some of the top cuts. Even some of the branches turned into good long cuts, you know. And uh, so the day came. We're going to pull out. Uh, the bottom like four cuts were just incredibly huge. Um, we could have stood in front of them and looked like uh, just our heads wouldn't have come nowhere near the middle of that the middle of that tree you know so uh he he brung in like he had brung in like eight or twelve or something mules he had borrowed other people's mules and these mules just like i said they looked like dinosaurs they were so big and they brung in they had to have like these custom made uh, jaws and chains and hookups because running this this many mules it really ain't ever been done in so many years uh, this stuff you, you didn't use this stuff anymore so um, they, they rigged up these riggings man and it, it was kind of easy to roll the trees you know because once once you had achieved a certain momentum on them they demolished whatever they touched so getting them down the rest of the way was was no problem and uh they hooked up these mules and by that time they had they had done cuts and paths but uh the bull done figured we're gonna roll these these logs down a certain area and then we'll pull them from there and um so we rolled them down and they got these gigantic jaws that it took so many men to hook up and then he hooked up this this team of uh, mules and these these uh, these these animals were you didn't need to do much for them to be motivated you know they they knew what certain sounds meant and when they couldn't achieve uh, their task they they seemingly got upset so when when you gave them the command to go uh, and they couldn't move then the mules started moving around and, and kicking and making noises. And, um, that, that log, them logs were not moving. Um, so, you know, they hooked up more mules, and that's what led to bringing in extra mules. And it was like them last mules they hooked up, it, it started moving finally. They brought in the extra mules. Um, so you had his, his eight and, and the extra, you know, eight or twelve. You had, you had sixteen or twenty mules. In this train uh, in front of these logs and uh, that's how many it took before they started moving and, and they barely moved they barely moved uh, and, and the mules are kicking and bucking and it, it took several breaks uh, per log to get these logs down uh, to uh, the road they'd cut in you know and it, it wasn't even the same day it was like they they worked in mules so much um the next day they had brung a different set they borrowed other people's mules and everybody was trying to get in on this this uh this gold mine that uh the bull had so you had people from all over the county bringing mules saying they can do this you know so you're you're hooking up these mules and uh they're rotating them out and uh you know a after a couple three four days of doing this um here you had uh veneer cuts of, of this tree um lined up along the road and uh they had to find a different haul truck to load these on too and then same way with everything else um they couldn't no matter what they did there was no way to to rig this up they brought in extra equipment like machines um to put these logs on these trucks and um, normally when you're loading up a log truck man you can fit you know half dozen to a dozen logs uh, and sometimes even more if they were the top cuts you could you could put quite a few top cuts on a on a trailer before it was full um, but the one thing I specifically remember was uh, the bottom cuts were one log per truck and um, the reason they brought in extra trucks and different trucks is that first truck they tried to put one of them logs on, uh, 
that was the last log that ever touched that truck. It it destroyed it. And uh, so, you know, once again, the, the people around the county, the legend was spreading. So he had all these these people willing to do whatever was necessary to get this to get these uh, these cuts out of this valley, so people could make money off of it. You know. Um, so loading them logs up that took quite a while and it was it was a pretty big deal too and uh, so that's all that's all said and done and it was a big payday and I don't know uh, like the following week you know everything had settled down and now this is gonna be as as the story is told cuz uh, us boys didn't go out uh, this following week I don't know what what or why but this is as per told uh, from the bull um, he'd always be you know when 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 dad's out there cutting bull would be within a certain radius and everybody else would be within a certain radius doing their own thing you know but the bull kind of knew what everybody was doing at every moment no matter how far or near uh, I don't care if it was off off sound or smell or sight that man knew what his guys were doing and uh, so dad's over there he's he's just it's a normal day nothing special cutting trees and he'd cut and so what they were doing was clearing up the rest of that valley since they done took the time to cut a road and uh, clear um, paths and had all these new ruts they were going to use them you know so they're up in there cutting down their their jacks and queens and all that and he had cut down just a normal one more or less and uh it it grabbed hold of what they call widow maker and uh that's more or less just um like a dead wood branch that uh either another tree left there while it was falling or it was just you know it was in a tree holding on for the last time it had before it had rotted enough to fall you know and um usually a tree struck by lightning would have several widow makers in it and you wanted to try and avoid uh, the, the widow makers when you're felling trees and, um, anyway he, he cut this this tree down it grabbed the top and it it chucked this widow maker up in the air and uh, it hit my dad and at the time um, dad would wear you know guaranteed two if not three pairs of uh, these these uh, really nice uh, coveralls because where my mom worked where she worked was a company that you, you have to buy the clothes in a mall now if, if you're lucky enough to find them they were really nice clothes and that was one uh, one thing was we since she worked there we actually had access to these really nice clothes so he had these really thick heavy duty coveralls that he paid top dollar for nowadays uh, we didn't think nothing of it because she worked there but he'd wear usually two pairs of them uh, three pairs of them if it was cold out and the pair he was known to wear would be normally this uh, tan color and he'd wipe his hands on them all day long so they were all dirty and greasy you know he'd, he'd uh, sharpen the chainsaw or greasing it whatever he'd wipe them and they were all dirty and greasy and uh, I know my family's gonna know what I mean when it was it was almost embarrassing to be seen with him wearing them them coveralls but you know it was just part of who he was you know and where we lived but that's all beside the point he was wearing like you know his his three pairs of coveralls on while he's out logging man and uh, this widow maker it got pulled down and then slingshot to him and and the bull said he's seen it all in slow mode because uh when a tree falls he wants to watch it so he could start thinking uh, uh, how he's going to get it out you know so he was there to watch every tree fall and uh he saw that widow maker and uh he yelled dad you know i ain't going to use his name but he yelled for him and it, it was flying through the air long enough he got time to yell at him and, and dad heard and dad looked and no sooner than dad looked that widow maker uh, hit him right square in the middle of his chest 
with quite a good velocity and it shoved him <clears throat> uh, straight across the ridge right there uh, into a whole bunch of underbrush and little trees and it made like what he what uh, what the bull described is it looked like a squirrel nest uh, it formed around my dad because uh, my dad was a pretty big fella and with those overalls on and coveralls on he was even bigger you know and that Widowmaker, it, it struck him and shoved him across the ground far enough to where he done gathered so much debris, he was buried in it. So, they, they starting, uh, everybody's starting to yell. Everybody knew the moment uh, that, that tree hit him. Uh, everybody knew, you know. I don't know what was said, but... You know, everybody starts running to him and digging him out. And up in there, pulling branches and uh, cutting and doing whatever was necessary to get to my dad uh, and get him out. This was back before cell phones, you know. So, and I mean, this was, we were so far out there, the nearest anybody with a house phone was even too far. So, this was, you know, get, get him in the truck. Uh, he'd been hit but because he had on so many layers of this really heavy duty uh, denim uh, really good strong fabric it stopped that branch from going through his chest or he would have been dead on, on impact uh, but it hit him in the chest and they dig him out and all they knew to do um, now my dad's point of view was he don't remember much he remembers uh, the bull yelling for him falling the tree um, seeing it and getting shoved in <clears throat> he remembers uh, seeing it and getting shoved in and uh, when I say shoved in he, he said it was like he, he was falling in a cave uh, the way the darkness came up on both sides of him from all the debris and everything just taking over his line of sight and then he don't he don't remember anything the next thing he remembers was uh, the bull saying his name and he remembers he took a real deep breath when he heard his name like he knew when he heard his name it like told him to breathe so he took a deep breath and opened his eyes and uh uh, the bull had these eyes that they were blue but they were so so light blue it was almost like an ice blue a uh, sky blue and uh, he described his eyes like that of an angel and the light around him uh, had been cleared back from the debris <clears throat> so you had the bull's head looking at him with them blue eyes and he was saying his name repetitively and he just kept saying his name till they got him to the hospital and he dropped him off at the hospital <clears throat> he came straight out he came straight out to the house and loaded all of us up and uh he said you know come with me and uh i don't remember much about it i just remember certain details so we we got back to the hospital there was my dad on his bed um and his coveralls all three of them being cut off from the crotch all the way up to the neck and, and the legs and the arms had all been cut off and it was laying there like this uh, this shell, this carapace almost with with blood all over it but <clears throat> that stick because of that fabric and his, his Kentucky bone it, it did not break his, his chest plate it hit him straight between his two uh, it hit him straight in the middle of his chest but it, it didn't it didn't break his bone and it didn't penetrate his skin i mean it ruptured it and there was this giant swelling they had to cut into and and, and relieve the pressure from but it, it didn't kill him and uh he was able to come home within a day or so uh, tough as he was um and uh there was such an outpouring from the community uh you know Uh, his coveralls done been replaced other people bought him new ones you know 
uh, Cherokee was so mad at the woods for what they did. Uh, he went out there with like this vengeance. Cherokee was so mad at the woods for what they had done to, to my dad. Uh, he went out there with this this vengeance and uh, in almost um, a ceremonial way, he cut this this widow maker, which was almost the length of a school bus. They hit my dad, and uh, like the area that hit his chest was about the size of a a, a big like a one of the larger cans of coffee. It was not like a little twig that flew through the air. This was a this was a branch. It was huge, you know, and uh, so he he cut this thing up in this ritualistic uh, Cherokee way, and he he had formed a, a walking stick out of the out of the one side of it, and uh, he gave it to my dad, you know, and that walking stick that was like my dad's that was the oddity that went with this uh, my dad's tale of surviving surviving this widow maker that. And that almost, it, it probably would have killed the normal man, but since my dad was so big and he, he was stubborn and always wore those extra layers of coveralls, um, he got to live to tell the tale. And uh, not only that, but he got to walk around using the, the spine of, of, the, of the coward that tried to kill him, you know. And I'll just end it there. I hope you enjoyed comment, like, share, and subscribe. Thanks.